Okay, well, welcome, guys. Um, this is our TVC BookTube and um, team panelists. We're so excited to have you. Thanks for being with us through all the tech stuff. I just want to introduce TVC a little bit. It's Teen Author Bootcamp for anyone who doesn't know. It's an annual um, conference where that's a non for profit where we educate a lot of teens in writing, storytelling, et cetera, and try to promote some literacy through that. If you're interested, please visit our website to register. Our panelists this year include like Christopher Polini, who wrote Aragon, which is super exciting, or like Lee Bardugo, who wrote um, Six of Crows and a lot of other really great books. Um, so feel free to visit that. And without further ado, um, Oh, and also we have some stuff going on with our social media that Natalie was going to talk about. Okay, so a couple things. On March 5th, we are having a fantasy trivia night with Christopher Polini, Brandon Mole, and Jessica Day George. If you want to um, if you want to go sign up for that, it's on the TVC website, teenauthorbootcamp.net. So go sign that up as well as the conference um, is well on there as well. Um, second, um, Mandy and Ben are both doing giveaways of um, Ben's book, um, The Bewilderness, and Mandy's book, um, I Am Mercy, and a sticker. So if you want to enter in that, go over to the Teen Author Bootcamp Instagram account, and you can enter in that. Um, the more people you tag, the more entries you get, and the more chances you get to get some really cool books. So... Yeah, and then we're going to move on to introduce some of our TBC panelists today. Yeah, so um, further ado, we have Kat Cho, who is the co-host of the Writer Die podcast, a podcast that interviews authors about the struggles of getting published and maintaining an author career. She currently lives in NYC or New York um, and spends her free time trying to figure out what kind of puppy to adopt. Aww. Kat is the international best-selling author of Wicked Fox and Witches Spirits. Then, okay, next we have Mandy Lynn, who published her first novel when she was 17. Um, the author of multiple books, Mandy spends her days continuing to write, creating YouTube videos to help others achieve their dreams of seeing their books published. Mandy is the owner of Stone Ridge Books, a company that works to help authors bring to life, bring their books to life through cover design and book formatting. She's also the creator of the Book Launch Planner, a planner designed to help authors publish and market their books. Okay, and then next we also have Ben Reeves, who has been writing fiction for around 15 years and loves helping inspiring authors. By day, he's a computer programmer for a book printing company. And by night, he writes fiction and runs a new booktube channel called 21st Century Writer, which is all about writing. He lives in England with his wife and two children. Okay, next we have Alexa Doan. Alexa Doan is the author of Brightly Burning and the Stars We Steal, why sci-fi romance retellings of classic set in space of now from Huffing Myth and Hardcore. A true INFJ, in her free time, she mentors with Right Girl, runs the author mentor match program, and manages one of the most popular writing advice channels on YouTube. Right. And then last but never least is Christine Riccio, who is a New York Times bestselling author of Again But Better. She's been on a quest to encourage more humans to read since the first, since the third grade. She started making videos about books on YouTube in 2010. Now her channel, Full and Banana Books, has over 40, I'm going to screw this up, I'm terrible with numbers, 400,000, 410,000 book-loving subscribers. Which is amazing. I've been, yeah, amazing. Yay! All of our panelists, we're so <laughs> excited to have you all here today. Um, so first off, um, we're going to start off with some individual questions to each of you. Um, so we'll start off with, um, let me pull up that list we had. Um, we're going to start off with Kat, I believe. So let me scroll down. Um, so Kat, most of your stories incorporate elements of your Korean heritage, specifically your, and I'm going to mess up the title, so forgive me, your Gimho series. Many tears fear being different, whether that is culturally, racially, or sexually. How can writing help them embrace their differences, and how does your diversity enrich your storytelling? Um, so first of all, I want to say, like, I think that it's really hard to find, like, your people 
Um, I, especially when you're trying to discover your identity, um, which is like a huge part of being a teen is like just trying to figure out who you really think you are and how you fit into the world. But it's also kind of why young adult literature is so amazing because it, it, I think that it's a time where you trying to discover who you are should be exciting. And I know it's mostly terrifying, at least it was for me when I was a teenager. Um, I was like one of the only Asian kids growing up in a Central Florida high school. And so my Asian identity wasn't really something that I connected to outside of my home. And so it felt like a very personal, private thing. Like I didn't really talk about it a lot with my friends. And when we did, it was more to like joke around, like, oh, the token Asian. Um, and I, I think that when I discovered books and reading and the reading community was when I first felt this acceptance of like all the different parts of my identity and that I didn't have to sugarcoat it. I didn't have to make it digestible for people because when the reason that so many people like to read is they like to read about experiences that they've never had, whether it's fantastical experiences like riding a dragon or experiences, lived experiences of people that they have not yet to meet or haven't had a chance to have one-on-one -on -one interactions with, which I think is the beauty of reading and writing. Um, it allows you to really embrace all the different parts of yourself and also to dissect it in a way that feels much more authentic than like just a quick, you know, movie or something like that. Like, you know, a two hour movie has to be exciting. You can't kind of delve into what a person is thinking in the moment. Um, so when I got into writing, it was a chance for me to explore my Korean identity in a way that I had never really felt comfortable bef doing before. And I would say that my, my ability to understand my Koreanness has developed exponentially with being able to read and write books more than when I was a teenager. So I really, really do encourage people who are writing to kind of incorporate a lot of yourself into it. I think that it, it, allows your authentic voice to come out, but it also allows you kind of to explore more of yourself. And I also think it's really important to understand that who you are now is valid, even if you end up changing in the future. And so the books that I wrote for my debut, Wicked Fox and Vicious Spirits, were who I genuinely was in like when I wrote them in like 2015 through 2018. Um, Cat Show now in 2021, I am very different from who I was in 2015. So a book that I'm writing now would not really incorporate all of the things that I have in Wicked Fox and Vicious Spirits, but I think that's fine. And I think that that's valid and your identity is always valid no matter how it's shifting and how it's changing. Um, so I think that you just be comfortable with embracing yourself and be comfortable with presenting it in your books, um, especially because our community is probably one of the most accepting and open communities that there really are out there. Um, and I also just want to add on that if there's something about your identity, like an, a marginalized identity that you don't feel comfortable discussing, you don't owe it to anyone. You're allowed to keep that for yourself for now and wait until you're comfortable talking about it. I think that one of the biggest things that I like to tell people when they have a marginalized identity is that you don't owe yourself to people. And we have a lot of conversations about own voices, but it's supposed to be a positive tool of saying like, your identity is worth while and valid and your story matters. It's not supposed to be a way to force people to talk about their marginalization in a way that makes them uncomfortable. So if there's anything about your identity that you don't wanna put into your stories right now, that's fine and you don't owe it to anybody. Awesome. I think that is really amazing for all the teens to hear, I mean, especially teen going through your teenage years. Okay, next we have Mandy Lynn. Um, Mandy Lynn, her, your novel, She's Not Here, in that novel, your characters deal with Alzheimer's. What advice do you have for writing characters with mental illnesses and or other diseases, and how do you start to develop these characters? Yeah, so for me, it, I had the advantage of writing that story in the fact that when I wrote it, not only did I have or have two grandparents that have Alzheimer's or a form of Alzheimer's, so I experienced it firsthand and the different 
elements of it and how it affects the family members. But I also worked at um, a hospital at the time. And one of the perks of working at that hospital was I actually uh, interviewed an, um, a doctor about his medical research for um, Huntington's disease. And in uh, interviewing him, I was actually able to kind of spark a few ideas for my own story. Um, so that's kind of where that all rooted from was from my job, from my own personal experiences. Um, I read up quite a few different books on Alzheimer's, um, but I think also an important thing is sensitivity readers um, and making sure that you have those readers to point out whether you you have something wrong or, or if you just, you know, some topics are a little touchy. Like even I've had people, cause I do, or I used to do a lot of in-person book signings and I would tell people like, oh, this book, it has Alzheimer's in it and it talks about it and how it affects the family. And of course the story is a lot more than that, but usually you could tell when someone had someone in their family with Alzheimer's because they'll automatically like step back and be like, I think that would be a little too personal for me. And which I totally understand. Um, Cause to me, writing She's Not Here was a little diary entry almost in that I was able to pour all those emotions into how you lose someone twice. You lose them first mentally. And it's like your family member is there and you love them. But at the same time, it's like, they're not there anymore, hence the title, She's Not Here. Um, but yeah, so I guess in, in essence, it's just, you know, drawing from your personal experience, doing a lot of research, and then going ahead and getting those sensitivity readers when possible. Yeah, that, I think that's a huge part of it, and I think that'll help a lot of people when they try to write stuff like that. Okay, next we have Ben. Um, in talking to you, um, you mentioned that you were almost traditionally published, but instead you were led to self-publishing. Your contemporary fantasy novel will be out this February. Um, what is one thing that you wish you knew at the beginning of this journey about publishing and that experience? Okay, yeah, it, it was a really um, tough experience actually because I did get so close to, well I thought I'd got really close to being traditionally published because I got an agent which is like for most writers it's like wow I finally crossed a little bit of a threshold here and I finally got an agent I signed the contract and and met her in London she's she's great and she's like a really uh top agent in London and I guess one of the biggest lessons that I learned was to not take anything for granted because um for whatever reason and quite understandably she just changed her mind about the book and we, we still have a really good working relationship but um, that book just completely fell through, unfortunately. And I just, one of the biggest lessons was not to take anything for granted. No matter how close you can get, it can still go wrong. And you should try and treat every single little uh, step along the way as a positive. You know, every, every good thing that happens is still a good thing. And uh, even if you have a few setbacks, that's, that's natural. I think I saw a quote today or something like, um, being a writer and not wanting to get rejected is like being a boxer and not wanting to get punched, which I thought was great. I thought that was really cool. Um, another lesson was specifically about um, self-publishing, which was that I'd always sort of stupidly want, sought traditional publishing. I wanted to be traditionally published and I kind of um, put a bit of stigma on self-publishing, which was so silly. Like some of the absolute best books that I've ever read are self-published some of the absolute greatest writers that I've ever spoken to present company included are amazing and I think any way that you can get your work out there is amazing and and to never favor one particular avenue over another they've all got their pros and cons and just do the best you can whatever whatever route you decide to go down awesome thank you so much Ben um, I think that'll help as well as just all the other advice because I definitely know not a ton about publishing and I know that I've always imagined getting traditionally published but self-publishing I think is another um, incredible opportunity as well um, just as you said. Okay next we have Christine. Um, many teens, teen authors are afraid to share their work. 
In your debut novel, Again But Better, you focus on the theme of being courageous enough to be yourself and take second chances. What advice would you give to young teen writers on how to overcome those fears and to not be afraid to, of trying again even after you failed? Yeah, so, I mean, like, this advice is always harder to do than to say, and that's one of the reasons why I wrote Again But Better, because I feel like it takes watching somebody fail and try again that's like you to feel like you can do it yourself. And I feel like that's one of the things, like I learned this the hard way that if you don't push yourself and like try to just go for things, nothing happens <laughs> and you don't grow. Like it takes failing and falling on your face to really learn like, oh wait, this didn't work, but now maybe I'll try it this way and maybe it'll work. Cause I mean, without, pushing yourself you kind of are just stay in the scene my phone I'm not even I'm not talking to you um <laughs> without pushing yourself you just end up in the same spot and I always like use the example of like myself in college like I went there expecting to like do all these things and like find all these opportunities and meet all these people and I just thought it was just gonna happen to me you know and it's the same with writing and and sharing your work and just being yourself and meeting new people like it, they don't just come to you. They don't just like knock on your door and ask for your writing and they don't knock on your door and be like, let's be friends. You have to like push yourself a step to like get out of your little bubble and just go for it, even though it's really, really scary. But you can do it is what you find once you step out. Like it's hard and awkward, but after you go through that like awkward, hard, scary phase, you're like, oh wait, I can do this again. It's fine. Like I am going to be okay. I survived that weird, awkward encounter and now I can do it better <laughs> because I know better because I did it once before. And, um, yeah, it's like that with literally everything. It's so hard. I feel like in our late teen years, that's when we're expected to start like, you know, doing all the things that we want to do. It's like, okay, well, you're almost an adult. Why aren't you trying? And it's like, cause it's so scary and it's so hard and I don't know how. And it's just, um, it's just literally just leaving and like going to do whatever like if it's a writing if you want to share your writing and like maybe you're going into college like maybe join like a creative writing club or anything like that it sounds stupid but like once you do it you start to just gain the confidence to do other things um because you know that you can do that i don't know if i just rambled into <laughs> like nothingness but um yeah just it's it's harder said harder done than said so i'm you just gotta go for it even though it's really scary <laughs> no i totally agree i think a ton of things have like apply to that um okay lastly for the individual questions we have alexa um alexa in your new book the ivy or your new book the ivies comes out in may it is a thriller about five girls wanting to get into ivy league by any means necessary even murder how do you develop characters that seem realistic even in a situation like this Additionally, many teens feel pressure not only to succeed in writing, but also in school. What advice do you have for teens trying to balance school on top of writing? Yeah, well, speaking to the first part, um, it's not so much about them feeling realistic, because I, I mean, in thrillers, how, real, how realistic are some thrillers? But it's, it's more um, that the characters feel emotionally honest, uh, organic, grounded in reality, even if you take them to an extreme. Um, and also it's thinking about conflict and stakes. So like my situation is extreme. I really hope no one murders anyone for Harvard. Uh, never say never, but I really hope not. But there are certainly real people who are incredibly ambitious and college admissions like is intense uh, and I have touched that industry which definitely helped so it was a matter of thinking when you put someone in a pressure cooker like this how can I design the pressure cooker and how can I design the characters where they're going to react in a way that's suitable to the story to the genre because obviously in a, in a more grounded realistic story without the murder um I'd have the characters would feel more realistic. Whereas here it's more about thinking about if I present this 
set of characteristics and journey, is it going to feel emotionally honest to the reader? Like, as long as it feels real relative to what you present to them, that that's kind of how I approach it. And in terms of if you're writing a fantastical story, you can work backwards too. like literally go, all right, these are the stakes in the conflict. How do I design my characters to fit this? Um, rather than being like, well, what would a real person do in this situation <laughs> uh, or a normal person? You, you sometimes have to design extreme characters for extreme situations. And then um, the second part, I mean, it's so stressful balancing school and writing. And once you're beyond school, work and writing or just real life and writing. And ultimately, writing, of course, can be work. We know it's work. <laughs> we know it can be hard. But if you're not enjoying it, it's okay to set it aside. It's okay to have a time when school's really, really stressful where you just focus on school because that's what you need to do to get through and over the next hurdle. Um, if the writing is stressing you out on top of the school. Um, but if it's something that it's just fun, it could even be like saying, I'm not going to stress myself out right now about finishing the novel i'll write some fanfic because school is really really stressful right now so it's giving yourself the grace to kind of always keep in mind that writing should be fun it should be a hobby especially when you're younger like no one's you know being like if you don't publish right now it's all for naught so just remember that it's fun and um but also it's always okay to to only focused on school for a while. Like we all have periods where it's like, I just have to focus on anything but writing because the writing isn't, it, it's subtractive, not additive right now. So, yeah. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. All of your individual answers were incredible. I definitely relate to almost all of them on a personal level. And I think I hope a bunch of the teams out there do as well. Um, so now we're going to take a quick break and show you guys a short video about TABC and a little bit more on that. Um, so Lauren, if you want to pull that up real quickly. Imagine a place where you can claim your power, where talented writers are there to aid you in discovering your hidden capabilities there are hundreds of people like yourself who want to build worlds. One day, dozens of New York Times best-selling authors, over 800 like-minded teen authors, Discover there's a power inside you to create, to transform, to achieve greatness. Team, author, you can't, you have to come. It's amazing. You will, you will change your life. You'll never regret it. These are tomorrow's writers, tomorrow's leaders, the kids who are going to change the world. Teen Author Bootcamp is making it happen. At Teen Author Bootcamp, you will discover writing is your superpower. And hopefully that came through all right for you guys. I know that videos can be a little bit sketchy with Zoom. But yeah, thank you guys for all your answers. Um, we'll move on to the group discussion and questions now. I've been seeing a lot of questions in the chat too, and we'll address those in a little bit. Um, let's see. And I think we'll start with, um, let's see here, if I can get it pulled up. All right, and then we'll start with um, Kat, I think, with this question, and then we'll go on to the rest of our panelists. Um, with what is the most important lesson you have learned while on your writing journey? It can either be in your life or specifically towards your writing career, but any lessons that you have learned? Um, I think the biggest lesson I learned was that there's a huge difference between accepting constructive criticism and resting all of my 
perceived self-worth on what other people think of me. Um, it's really hard when you put yourself out there creatively uh, because your heart is in your story, right? So your story is very representative of who you feel you are as a person. And so for someone to seem to reject it, which as Ben told us, rejection happens in publishing a lot. Um, it makes you feel like you're being rejected as an individual, as a person. And it's, I feel like it's really important to start working really early to understand that it's, it, that's not what it is. It feels like that. I completely understand. I still feel like that to this day sometimes. Um, but when someone just doesn't click with your story or with your writing, it's, it's a very individual case. And the way that they're coming from it is most of the time being like, this individual piece of writing just isn't for me. It wasn't something that I find entertaining, but it's not like you're a bad writer. That's not what anyone is really trying to say. Um, and I also just really think that as you get more evolved in, in your writing and get more involved in the community, you realize that you, you naturally start to create a group of people who are trusted and who you understand like their opinion really does matter because they understand your writing and what you're trying to do. And it's really important to create groups like that um, so that you can go to this trusted group of people and say like, hey, can someone read this for me? Can you give me advice? And the conversation with them is more, um, is, is more of a trusted conversation, like you know how to talk to each other. Um, so that their opinion is presented in a way where it makes sense to you, as opposed to like reading reviews of your book and being like, oh, this, you know, like X star 225 really hates love triangles and I have a love triangle in my book, so I should just, you know, stop writing. Um, so, you know, there's like this in joke with, with pub authors where we say to each other, like, don't read the reviews. Um, and it's definitely because we we tend to take things to heart um, a lot and we tend to dwell on the negative more than we do on the positive. But it's really important to understand that, you know, everyone has an opinion, but you don't have to, you don't have to listen to everyone's opinion when it comes to your writing. Um, you, you're allowed to write for yourself and you're allowed to write for those trusted people in your inner circle. And I'll just say uh, briefly, a big one for me um, was to never underestimate yourself. And I think we tend to do that as authors. Like we're the first person to say, I'm not good at this, the imposter syndrome. Um, but what surprised me is it truly is a journey. Like I'm able to write things now and tackle challenges that I, I couldn't have fathomed or certainly handled five years ago, 10 years ago. And like, I joke about it, but I literally had said in the past publicly, I would, I'll never be good enough to write a mystery. And now that's what I write. I wasn't ready. So I, we need to stop the negative self-talk. Like, but like, I, I've really learned like, oh, don't underestimate yourself. And every book you write teaches you something about a book you're going to write in three years. And I love that. And we're always growing. You're never standing still. Yeah, and I think one of the things I learned a lot was not to let, like, perfection stop you from writing. Because I, for me, I was always, especially recently, I'm always like, I have to get the outline and have it outlined perfectly before I even attempt to start writing this. And I realized, like, why waste my time trying to figure this out when I can just write what I know and then for me, I'm the type of person that like half outline, half pantses. So usually at some point I'll either abandon the outline or I make a outline based solely on like the save the cat writes a novel sort of structure. Um, Cause like right now the book I'm working on is, it doesn't have a five point finale. It has a finale, but not like that glorious five point finale and I know for a long time I was like I can't start writing it until I figure out what the finale is gonna be like and eventually I was like you know what I'll just figure it out when I get there and I ended up doing that and this five point finale since I then through the writing process got to know my characters better and got to know like what the real stakes were this five point finale kind of fell into place naturally. 
Um, and it, it's also just learning how you as a writer work. Uh, so that works for me, but you may be the total opposite in a process like that may work well, it may not work well. So it's all about just how you work. Yeah, I, th I think that is so important. Um, you, there's no one way of writing, so you've got to do what works for you. And I think it's it's such a cliche answer, but you've got to enjoy it. And if you don't enjoy it, that's okay, but just take a step back and writing is hard and it should be hard, but you shouldn't have to suffer for it. If, you're, if you really feel like, it, you, you know, it's, it's hurting you, take a step back. Maybe there's a different way of coming at the problem, um, but always understand that you're not alone. There's people you can talk to because writing can be so hard, um, but there's so many people out there who, are facing exactly the same problems as you and it's great to just talk to them and um, figure out how to get through it together because it th there are so many um, specific problems that you might encounter on your journey of writing um, and it's very it's going to be very unlikely that no one's ever come across this problem before so um, just enjoy it understand that you're not alone and exactly like Mandy said um, just do what works for you there's no right or wrong way of doing it. If it works for you, then it, it works and that's perfect. Um, okay, everyone's answers were great in all things that like I was like kind of thinking as well. They were all great lessons. So, I mean, I feel like the biggest thing that I learned as like a teen going into my early 20s was like, to believe in myself because at that point, I just remember feeling so... Um, overwhelmed by the idea of writing my own book and my own story because I was, you know, obsessed with like Harry Potter. And I was like, this is so intricate. How can I ever build up to this? And like Alexa was saying, you learn and you get there, but it takes time and you write what you want to write right now and what you, and you can write, like you can do it. It just, you have to fail and try again or do something else and you learn from that and keep going. Um, but at that time, like when I was a teenager, I just believed like I could never finish a book. I could never write a whole book. That just seemed impossible. And then like, I wrote a book and I was like, oh man, like it just, you know, it just took dedicating the time to it every day and really wanting to do it. And if you really want to do it, you can finish a book. You're going to, and you're going to learn from that book. And it, just like everyone else said, you're going to learn how you write. Like everyone touched on the most amazing lessons that you learn. Um, so agree with everything everyone said. You guys have all amazing answers. Um, this question might reiterate some of this again, because our next question is, what is one thing you wish you would have known as a young writer? But I think this can be approached from a few different ways too. And I was thinking that Alexa could start on this one if you have an answer, but that's okay yeah. if we're reiterating things too. No, I, I do, because I didn't write a novel till I was 29. Before that, I wrote fanfic, no regrets. Um, but like literally me as a young writer, um, I wish... I had known that being writing fiction, writing books didn't mean the next great American novel. I had one idea of what it meant to be a writer and what was good enough to be a writer. And I didn't measure up to that in my own mind. I mean, also realistically, let's be fair. But I wish my younger self had realized there's no one way to write a book. It's a, it can be just as much about storytelling as beautiful MFA level prose and tell a good story. And, and I wish I'd known that because maybe I would have tried to write a novel sooner. I, I feel like I missed some years, but I still, I wrote Harry Potter fan fiction since we're on a Harry Potter theme in the chat. And that was pretty great. <laughs> yeah, I love that advice. I, I would say that, um, like I, when I was younger, I wish that I had known that all types of writing are valid. I think sometimes there's this like unspoken hierarchy within publishing, like, oh, you write adult literature or, and stuff like that. Like I wrote a novel, um, but like, like Alexa, you said like, oh, I didn't really write, I wrote fan fiction. That's, I count that as really writing. I think you totally really wrote stuff. And, and it's advice that I've gotten and I've given before. Like if you're trying to find your voice, then just write fan fiction because yeah. 
you don't have to like think about like, oh, what does this world look like? It's already been created for you. You're just writing what you think these characters do like at a coffee shop instead of at Hogwarts. Um, so, I, and, and I think that especially, you know, we're writers who write in middle grade and, and young adult and, and we've experienced a lot of people looking down on us for it, but middle grade and young adult is some of the best literature that I've ever read because it touches on things and allows us this creativity and genre stretching that just isn't allowed in other age categories. And it allows us to kind of have more imagination and explore topics that are real life important topics in ways that can maybe be more fantastical and reach more audiences. Like I write about like, you know, trying to struggle with your identity and trying to fit in. And that is a lot of stuff that I felt as a Korean girl living in a mostly white community, but I wrote it as like a fox demon amongst humans. And that, it was so much easier for me to write it that way. And young adult gave me the chance to do that. So never discount your writing just because you think you're writing in something that people don't take seriously because all writing is important and valid. Mm -hmm. And I know for me, because when I, I published Essence when I was 17 and I had like, as a teen author, I was not only like stupidly confident, but I had this almost obsession with being that teen author. And I kind of wish there had been someone to like tap on my shoulder and be like, you don't have to be young to pub like. I, I just had this weird thing where like I had to publish as a teen and that would make me cool. Um, and I kind of felt like I became so obsessed with achieving this goal that part of me kind of missed out on those awesome teen years of like being in high school and really enjoying those experiences and doing all these things that my friends did. But I was so like in this world of, my book and publishing it and doing all of that, that I feel like I kind of missed out on that. And I wish there had been someone to be like, you, you are just, success, just as successful if you published when you're not a teen as when you do publish when you're a teen. Like, yes, it's a cool bragging, right? Of course. Yeah. Um, but I wish I had taken that. And I'm, I also to this day struggle with being like a workaholic. It's just, what I do and it developed at a very early age for me um so I just wish for me as a team to have stood back taken that breath and really experienced those things in your life so then you can later put that into your writing because that is so important for me at least and I'm sure many writers as well is the way you learn to write about the world is by experiencing the world and noticing the little details that for some people they don't notice it and it's our job to kind of notice these things and put it into writing. I really wish that someone had come back and told me all those things as a teen as well. Um, I think the biggest one for me was, was the realization that although writing is an art, there are ways of doing it that are gonna be considered uh, more mainstream successful than, than others. And, and neither way is right. You can write something that's really artistic and very uh, different to anything else, or you can write something that's very mainstream, or you can write something that's kind of in the middle, which is kind of literary fiction. And I, I guess the main thing that I wish someone had come back and told me is, look, Ben, here are some great books that you can read about writing. Here are some great blog posts that you can uh, read about writing. So uh, a, a huge book that changed my life was called How to Write by Harry Bingham. And I always struggled with, I, I'd write loads and loads and loads of stuff and I would never know although I quite liked it, I would never have any clue whether this would be considered good writing by say an agent or a publisher or a reader or, or bad writing. I had no clue. How, how did I know? I was just, I was just writing what I felt and, and there's nothing wrong with that either. But what, what this particular book did for me was to, to make me realize, okay, so there are things actually that this is not considered great. And that doesn't mean you can't do it. All rules are there to be broken. Um, but there's definitely going to be things that are going to give you a, a head start and, and grab readers quickly and um, make readers feel more emotion and things like that. And there's, there are right and wrong ways of, of doing that, certainly. And one of the biggest ones in this book, um, How to Write, was, was clarity. You've got to be clear because if it's not clear, it could be the most amazing story in the world. But if, if we don't even have a clue what's going on because the sentences and the structures and the, the scenes aren't clear, then, then that's no good. You, you've really got to focus on, on clarity. That was one of the 
biggest eye openers for me I was like of course and then I spent the next like year focusing on how to make sentences more clear you know how not using pointless words that don't need to be there and, and focusing on the the start and the ends of sentences so that we really have a good sense of what's going on um, so yeah definitely to, to all you guys who are watching um, how to write a Harry Bingham huge for me life changer um I feel like I think I'm last again and everyone said really great amazing things already but uh on a lighter note I mean something for me that really changed my mindset and I wish I wish someone had slipped me twilight earlier and it's because I was obsessed with all these like fantasy novels even like when I was through elementary school you know I loved Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and the witches. And like, then in high school, like all I knew about was Dan Brown and like, and again, Harry Potter. And they were all these big intricate stories. And for school, we always, even the ones I liked were like these really deep stories and they always had a male protagonist. And I just like never felt, that's what made me feel like I couldn't write a book because there was never a book about like a girl, like living life that I read. And then I read Twilight and one of the, it sounds dumb to everyone now that like Twilight changed my life, but that was literally the first book that I read about a teen girl, <laughs> like that was like going through stuff that I felt like I was going through. And I was like, oh my God, uh, people like books about teen girls and people write like romantic books that I feel like I relate to. Like I could write something like this. And it changed my perspective on like everything I believed about myself and seeing Twilight be so successful and feeling that connection to a main character and realizing like there was contemporary romance. Like romance is just not a thing that we ever read in school. And that was ever like, in the school libraries even like i never came across that it was always like i and i loved reading i read everything in like my classroom libraries and stuff but i just never stumbled across something where i was like oh it's a girl with a crush on a boy and like it, they fall in love and I, and I loved that and that's like what i wanted to write so that changed everything for me and um and I feel like everyone has a book like that. And it's just the, like the sooner you find it, the sooner you believe in yourself. And that's why it's so great to be like open to new genres and new stories. And once you find that one, they're like, oh my God, this is me. It changes your perspective on everything. Okay, thank you. I, I'm learning a lot from this too. All right, so then our next question with Christine starting, sorry that you've gone last twice in a row, um, is what is the most important element of writing to focus on in your first draft? Plot, setting, character, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm, for me, it's definitely character. And I think it's different for everyone, depending on how you write, since everyone figures out how they write and then you know has their thing that they work on first. I need to know my characters to be able to move forward and something I've learned you know, through this my writing journey is that like if you write you can keep writing stuff that not, won't necessarily be in the book and you could take it out later but that's going to help you get to know your characters and that's going to help you you know formulate the plot and then setting and such can come as you go but if you don't know your characters then it's hard to write their dialogue and know their motivations and i find it really helpful to write flashbacks and just to know exactly what made these characters them, what made them them. And then when you know that, you know how they're gonna react in different situations. And that really allows me to move forward and plot out what's going to happen in different situations. Cause if I don't like know them, then I'm just like, how would this even go down? I don't know. Yeah, that's, that's, that's like, go to the next person. <laughs> Well then, Alexa, if you want to talk next, or if anyone else has any thoughts. Sure. Uh, I um, I start with concept, which is different from plot. Um, I always I start with a, a high concept, or um, sometimes that concept is setting. Sometimes, now that I write thrillers, it's 
literally a motive for murder is actually what I'm working back from nowadays. I, I two books in a row, I've, I figured out uh, on one, it was like, this is the motive. And I had to work backwards from that and on the IVs. And then on my current one, I'm working backwards from the twist. So I can't say what that is, but I, I, I literally had to build a plot around a twist, which is a very weird thing to do, but characters are always second. It's like, here's my concept what characters are going to support that concept um and then setting is usually last but sometimes it's simultaneous to the character so like with the ivies it was like well these characters would work best and where would these characters sit best a boarding school so but like for me it's always concept and character are married to each other um even though i'm a very character driven writer um, but that that's kind of how it works for me yeah, I mean, I'm pretty much just going to agree with Christine and Alexa and say character. And, and the thing that I will say is that there's, I, there's a huge difference for a lot of writers, the brainstorming stage versus the drafting stage. Like, um, I know that even if you're a pantser, there's still kind of like a small brainstorming stage in the beginning, um, which is where I start all over the place. Like every book has started at a different point when I'm brainstorming. But when I'm actually drafting, I do concentrate on character and it's really for a simple reason. If your character is boring or two dimensional, then it affects every other element of the story as opposed to like anything else, because there are so many books out there where literally nothing happens, but because the character is interesting, people still will read it. So if you want to just put more weight on one individual element, then character is where you should put all of your attention on, I think. Yeah, and I, I definitely have to agree because for me, like the concept always comes first and then it's like, all right, how can I build this character to make this concept the hardest thing they will ever go through and then make them grow from that? How can I, at the beginning, make them this one character and at the end blossom into something entirely different and something that has, or someone I should say, that has really grown? Um, and it's interesting because for me, like, I feel like I have a habit of not sticking to genres. One of the perks of being self-published is that I can play around and do whatever I want sometimes. Um, but for each genre I've written in, it's like different books are driven by different elements. Like for my first couple of books, they were very emotional driven. So I felt very strong connections to my characters. And then like, as I write in other genres, it's interesting to see like how I work with those characters differently. But yeah, it's definitely without that strong character and those strong bonds, you can't make a reader emotionally invested the way you want them to be. Yeah, I, can, I completely agree. Characters are so important. As you say, like you could have the most simple story in the world. It could just be two people in a room talking, but as, if those characters are really engaging, then it's going to be a great story. And for me, some of the most important questions that I can ask about my characters are what do they want more than anything in the world? Like what does this person actually want? Um, what's stopping them from getting that thing that they want? And, and very often what is their weakness or their flaw or their thing that they could change that's going to help them to get the thing that they want? Um, a lot of stories at their heart are, are, are about that if you really break it down. Um, the other thing that I sometimes start with is, is, uh, is a bit more uh, wishy-washy than that. It's kind of, I, I get sort of a feel of what the book is. I can't describe it in any words. I just get a sense of a, a kind of tone of what this story is going to feel like when people read it. So, for example, it might be this is going to be quite a mysterious, dark, yet uh, beautiful book or this is going to be a very strange, surreal, um, circusy kind of book, but I, I, I don't yet know what any of the characters are or what it's about or anything. I just have that feel that I know I want to create in the reader when they read it. And um, that's, that's a big one for me. All right, thank you. It's interesting to hear the different methodologies, even if they're for the same, like, you know, core line of thought. Um, so for this one, I think we'll start with Ben, if that's okay. Um, what do you think the best way to stay motivated is when you're writing and how do you find inspiration? Oh, that's such a tricky one. Um, 
I, I have to be enjoying what I'm doing. If I'm not enjoying it, then there's no chance I'm going to sit down and, and start writing it. So the question becomes, how do I make myself enjoy it? And that's to, to write, someone said it quite rightly in the chat, um, write what you want to write. That's absolutely 100% true. You have to, there's no point in trying to say, say for example, vampires suddenly got really popular again. Um, there's no point if you don't like writing vampire fiction, there's no point in you writing va vampire fiction just because it happens to be popular for no other reason than uh, by the time that you write it and publish it, it, you know, tastes change. But also you, you have to enjoy it because if you enjoy it, that's going to come out on the page. So and if, if I enjoy it and I'm excited by it, then I'm always motivated to sit down and, and write it. And and actually, if you really, really love the thing that you can do. That you're writing it can actually come out very quickly because you just love it so much and you never feel demotivated because it's exactly what you wanted to write in the first place yeah i mean building off of that um you have to love the story that you choose in order to stay motivated throughout the whole process so before you decide like this is what you're going to write make sure you're absolutely in love with it and that's going to motivate you and make you write faster and all that but even when that happens like sometimes you get into these ruts where you feel stuck and you feel like you can't continue and um my favorite way to like re-motivate myself or re-inspire myself is um to watch or read a story that is similar to my own because there's one out there and i my favorite was to watch a movie because you know it's faster you get two hours you watch it and like you feel reinvigorated like oh like just by watching it thing cogs start to move in your head like oh wait that could if i could do this and this like this is how you know you just see the structure of how they told their story and that structure starts to help you figure out your own um, and yeah, that was a piece of advice that I got from my screenwriting teacher back in college and it works every single time I get stuck. I go watch like some movies that have like a similar plot, similar themes and all of a sudden like I can move again. Um, well, I'll say there's nothing more motivating like a deadline. <laughs> Uh, whether someone gives it to you or you can set it for yourself, uh, even if you don't have a publisher giving it to you, um, sometimes that that's the thing that makes me do the thing. Uh, but also, it's writing something that you love and you really want to explore and make happen. But I'm currently in Act Two, which is an in the middle it's a nightmare and every book I hit a point where I regret everything I second guess everything I'm like why did I ever think I could do this and what motivates me I love editing I and especially because I've done it before you can fix anything in a book later it's a later problem and that personally motivates me because drafting can be so hard but I know that it's, it's the fighting perfectionism thing. I know that it's okay because it doesn't have to be perfect. If it's not feeling exactly the way I want it to, I'll fix it later. And that motivates me. Um, and I do the same thing, Christine, for inspiration. And then the other thing I do is I, I talk to trusted writer friends. That can help me get out of a rut. The, the, those poor souls who just have to hear me like throw like I'm asking them questions they can't even answer because like they probably haven't even read it but weirdly talking about what I'm facing can help unlock something in my brain also taking time off is amazing sometimes just don't write for a few days that's okay it's okay to take a break and refill your well and it'll come back hopefully deadlines are great yeah so <laughs> that's how deadlines are great great uh, <laughs> um I agree with what everyone has been saying, um, and I don't want to like just repeat everybody, but I will say that um, self care is a huge part of the whole entire writing process. I think that a lot of times, especially when we're on deadline, we tend to like let things like basically taking care of ourselves fall to the wayside. And that's really bad because like if you're not healthy mentally and physically, then you can't really write very well. Um, so, so take care of yourself for sure. Um, especially nowadays. But then um, the other thing um, I want to add on to what Alexis said is to set deadlines for yourself and to go a little step further if you want to, um, you know, is that 
writing often seems like such an isolated activity, like you're doing it all by yourself, but you don't have to do it by yourself. And so what you can do is you can promise a chapter to a friend or a beta reader. And that way you're creating a deadline for yourself where you're held accountable by someone else other than yourself. Um, and of course, like, you know, if you need to change the deadline, you, you can, but like just making that verbal promise to someone else um, kind of helps you be motivated. Um, and then the final thing I'll say, I'm also stealing from someone else from the amazing Susan Dennard, and she talks about this thing called magical cookies. And what a magical cookie is, is like the scene you're writing towards, like you really love writing fight scenes and you know there's going to be one in act two. And if you're feeling stuck and you want to skip to your magical cookie, then you, this is me giving you permission. Um, you do not have to write in order. Like Alexa said, you can just write like, come back to the scene. Um, we use the abbreviation TK a lot because it's very easily findable in a document. Um, TK add this. Um, so yeah, just write your magical cookie and it might inspire you and then you can go back. <laughs> um, I recently discovered the beauty of learning when it's okay to put a project down for a little bit. I was, I think for almost two years working on the same thriller novel and plot wise, it was the most complex thing I'd ever written. Um, and I got as far as like getting halfway through act three and I just got stuck, <laughs> like so, so stuck. And then some stuff happened in my personal life that was a little too thriller novel-esque for my taste. And it made it very hard to work on this book. Um, just emotionally, it was very hard to get back into that story. So I put it down for a long time and I was talking to some writer friends about like, you know, this is, this is a story I'd rather write. Like, I'm so sick of working on this book and it's so hard. And my friend was like, why don't you just write that? Um, so I closed the, the door on that project and I said, I'll come back to you later. And I outlined this book for like one week. And then for NaNoWriMo worked on this new project and I finished the first draft in a month and a half. And that's just the difference between actually enjoying a story and pushing yourself through it when you aren't necessarily ready to work on that project. Um, and that's not to say I'll never go back to that project, but for me, it was just so important to invest my time into something that felt better for me. And it was also just so therapeutic to write this new story and to write about something I really, really love because the new story is like called Project Road Trip. It's all about travel and rediscovery and it was just rediscovery of myself at the same time so it just felt really good so it goes back to write what you want to read and that was something that I wanted to read so I wrote it down yeah, thank you guys that that's really helpful I'm gonna combine some of the questions for the sake of time and I think we'll start with Mandy on this one um, but what can teens start doing now in order to start um, pursuing a writing career? And how has YouTube impacted your writing career? Sorry, I'm fumbling on more words. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I would say YouTube is like half of my writing career. It's a very odd thing. Um, but for me, YouTube was always a way for me to document my journey and to now just teach people what I have learned because there's a lot of stuff you have to figure out, especially if you're self-published that you'd never in a day thought you would have to learn. I spent an entire day learning website coding. It was very strange, but um, I guess just, just start, you know, start um, researching stuff. And especially when it comes to your writing career, just start reading and read as much as you can and read widely. You will learn so much from so many different genres. Um, and I guess just my biggest, uh, when it comes to, if you want to talk about YouTube is don't fear perfection. Like you don't have to be a perfect YouTuber to be a YouTuber. You can just start and you'll figure it out as you go, but also don't force yourself to be on YouTube if you don't want to be on camera. Um, I've had a lot of people say that they're like, how can I be a YouTuber, but I don't want to be on camera. It's like, well then don't be on camera. You can find a different platform somewhere else like Twitter or Instagram where you can take photos of books or you can tweet about the books. Um, just find whatever works for you. You don't have to do what everyone else does 
because it might not work for you that way. Um, sorry, Lauren, could you repeat the question, please? Yeah, sorry, I was kind of fumbling over my, my word. <laughs> I'm still fumbling, <laughs> not really helping my situation much. But basically, like what can teens do now? Like That was it. I'm so sorry. Yeah, yeah that, basically, basically that. And how has cool. YouTube helped you in your career? Okay. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think, I think if you can write every day, don't beat yourself up if you can't, but every single time you sit down and, and start typing or put pen to paper, uh, it's absolutely great practice. It's just like, I've said it on my channel loads of times, but if you play piano, um, you want to try and sit at the piano every day, but again, don't beat yourself up if you can't try and read lots. If you if you can't write every day, at least try and read, um, read books that are within the genre that you're really interested in writing in and read books that are outside of the genre that you're interested in writing in because you're going to pick up lots and lots of little bits of inspiration all over the place. And it's all kind of going to go in your head and swirl around and allow you to, it's going to give you fuel to be able to create something completely new that didn't exist before. And you really need that fuel. So you need life experience. You need to um, meet as many people as you can, obviously not easy right now, but um, read as many books as you can, write as much as you can. Um, in terms of YouTube, my channel's really new. So I only started it in September. Um, I've, I think I've got like 200 and something subscribers, which is very low compared to my, my counterparts and friends here. Um, but uh, I, I guess um, I, I love just trying to pass on as, as much writing advice as I can. I don't ever claim to know everything. I, of course, I don't. I don't think anybody does. But um, I, certainly, hopefully, you can learn from my mistakes and um, hopefully pick up some shortcuts, things that took me ages to learn. I can pass on in five or ten minutes. So that's always really fun. Um, okay, so, yeah, the what you can do now to start your writing career, like everyone said, reading widely, like reading and writing. And it, writing can be as simple as journaling or even just, and yeah, and trying new things and meeting new people, blah, blah, blah. But <laughs> writing in a journal, just like how you're feeling and just keeping some record of your life and what you're doing is gonna be so helpful in the future. And um, YouTube obviously has had an enormous impact on my life and my writing career. In college, I started YouTubing because I, I, I said something about a screenwriting class, like I didn't think I could write a book. So I was like, I want to write screenplays because, you know, that's 120 pages. That's uh, two hours. I could do that. Um, so, and I wanted to be able to edit um, because that was my other thing that I like to do with film. So I wanted to make creative content and edit it. And that turned into my YouTube channel. And I love books and reading, obviously, because I love writing. And then I started talking about books on YouTube. And once I graduated, I came to a point where I was like, YouTube was starting to take off in general as an actual thing. And I saw, I followed a lot of filmmakers because <laughs> I wanted to make films. And I saw how they were using YouTube as a platform to help get their films made. And I was at a point where I started writing a novel, but I was like, I could focus my energy on this or I could focus my energy on YouTube, which I know it, my YouTube was starting to take off because I was making so much content and I was putting so much effort into it. I, I was like, I could go full force here. And when I'm completely ready to write my novel, because I didn't really feel like I knew what I was doing right out of college and I could write like my novel. I was at that point where I was still like, I don't know, I don't know. I bought Scrivener and I was like, what is Scrivener? Um, that's a writing um, application. So I made that decision. I was like, I'm going to put everything I have into my YouTube channel. So I feel like I have like a stable ground to stand on in terms of a job and in terms of like just an audience. And then maybe when I write my book, it's going to be easier because I have an audience there and I've built it and I put so much work into creating all different sorts of like I wanted, I was doing comedy content and all sorts of stuff like that. Um, so I, once I felt stable and like YouTube was my job and I had like an income, that's when I was like, okay, now I can do half YouTube and half writing and I'm not going to feel like I'm floundering because obviously like when you're writing, you have to have a day job and that was, I wanted YouTube to be my day job. Um, so like YouTube had a huge impact because once I started to decide, I decided to write my book, I could tell my audience that I could go on that journey 
with them. And it made it so much more fun for me to look forward to like venting about this process every week in my vlogs and like learning as I go. And my first book was all about college because that's like where I felt I, you know, had my whole like, you know, evolution as a human being and study abroad. And I was able to go back to like those videos that I made when I was studying abroad to just like get back in the mindset of like a 20, my 20 year old self. And it was just like, it all came rushing back. And you could do the same thing if you're journaling throughout your like teen years and like you, you wanna write a book about being a teen, like you start to forget these little details about like how you felt and how insecure you were in these weird ways. And if you go back and open a journal entry, they all come rushing back to you and it's so helpful. Like if I tried to write a Gemma Better Now, I don't think I could do it as well just because I wasn't as close to that age, but also like if I didn't have those videos, I don't know if I would have been able to slip back into that age mindset so easily. So writing your feelings, keeping a blog of some sort is really, really helpful just because you're going to pull from all your life experiences when it comes to writing. Gosh, my teen journals are so cringe. Uh, you, you are correct. <laughs> it was actually refreshing because I went back and went, oh, I thought I was so mature, but I was still a teenager. Just a nice reminder. <laughs> Um, yes to everything. Like I, I will like scream till the, like I'm hoarse, like read, 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 like read. Uh, but also just live your life, have experiences. Uh, because like, I know it's so cliche and try it and you've heard it, but it legit does help you later. Like you're writing a book and you're like, oh, I can insert that nugget based on that thing I did. So, you know, be present in things and do things, uh, write fan fiction. Honestly, that's my number one. Um, that was massive for me because one thing about writing original work that can be challenging is it is, a, it's a little harder to find people who want to read it, to get some of the feedback and encouragement that you want, critique partners, etc. But fan fiction comes with a built-in community and that was just massive for building my confidence as a writer and having fun with fiction. And YouTube, oh gosh, it's, it's had a huge impact. The, the weirdest thing that I didn't expect, um, people on YouTube, the audience really loves craft advice. And I never liked talking about craft. I, I had never read a craft, well, other than Save the Cat, but I have issues with Save the Cat, the original one, Blake Schneider. But like, that's the thing. I don't like getting into the weeds on craft. I'm a pantser. And I was like, they want me to talk about like craft, but I challenged myself to actually think, well, how do I write? And it's made me a better writer interrogating craft i've i've re i recognize things in my own writing like i've had to work on filtering and all adverbs and because i like if i was gonna make a video about it i should kind of do it practice what i preach and it's made me a better writer uh but also just it's been such a relief to know that i have something that i have a author platform that is mine that I built that I control because uh, so much of publishing is out of your control especially when it comes to the marketing side and it's nice to know like I have a place I can do an ARC giveaway and it's a space that's mine and I can you know run my own pre-order campaign or I can like it's nice knowing that I've crafted a space because sometimes in publishing it's like does my publisher remember me? And I love that about YouTube, that it's like, it's, it's, it's mine. And, and just being able to com uh, connect with people, so. Um, I'm so grateful that I went last for this one because I was like, how, how did I start my writing career? I have no idea. Um, also, like, kudos to people who are honest in their teen um, journals. I was, like, constantly afraid someone was going to find it and read it. So I, like, always presented this part of m myself that was, like, I got in a fight with my best friend, but, like, I understand her point of view. Like, I'm so <laughs> understanding and giving. Um, but <laughs> I just could not handle myself. But, um, yeah, I, um, I'm not going to give craft advice because everyone gave such good craft advice. I'm going to give uh, career advice um, just because for a writing career, the, the harsh reality, I'm going like the harsh reality Alexa Dunn uh, YouTube channel style here, um, is that it's not just writing, unfortunately. Um, and, and it doesn't matter how you're publishing, self-publishing, traditional publishing, indie press, anything like that. 
you're going to have to do other things for your career. And one of the biggest things is to promote yourself. And uh, there's a lot of discourse right now about like how much responsibility we should have as authors promoting ourselves. But I think the best thing to do kind of ties into the whole like how YouTube has influenced our careers. And it's that create a community as quickly as you can. Um, because not only is it great to support you while you are writing to have a community, but once you do start to put your work out there, there are going to be people who naturally want to support your work and talk about it and yell about it because they already like you as a person. They've already gotten to know you as a person. Um, and it's really great to have that um, and to not feel like you're all alone in trying to get your story read. Um, and the way that I think is the best to create a community is to be yourself. I think that sometimes when you're, you're hearing like, oh, get on social media because it's a good promotion platform, you think you have to present a brand of yourself. And I think that that's just too much pressure. And there's so many different definitions of what a brand is to begin with, just to be honest and be yourself. Like I loved that Christine was talking about how she started naturally talking about books because she loves books. Like it, like that was as simple as that. And people connected to her and her channel because of that. Or Alexa likes right talking about craft and, and what she's doing to try to get her books out there and people connected to that. But it's because they're both being their genuine self and you can tell. So whatever social media platform you decide to use, it doesn't need to be YouTube. It can be a blog, it could be Twitter, it could be TikTok, um, whatever you're comfortable with. Present just what you love because then the authenticity of your love comes through and people connect to that. Why, like I, I love talking about K-dramas and people love talking to me and like, it's not always applicable to my books, but like every once in a while, someone will be like, Wicked Fox reads like a K-drama. I'm like, thanks, buy my book. <laughs> Um, you know, so, and, and I see you guys talking to each other in the chat now, and, and these conferences are a great way to connect with people, share your Twitter handles with each other, follow each other on Instagram, like, this is a great jumping off point to try to find a community, like, Teen Author Bootcamp didn't exist when I was a teen, and I wish it did, because then I would have had so many more writing friends so much earlier, and been less scared to actually start writing. No, thank you. It is really hard to find writers, especially like, you know, in high school or middle school, because, you know, sometimes they're a little bit of the outcasts. Um, but I think it's about time for our lightning round, if you guys are ready, if Madeline's ready too. Yeah. Um, Mandy, did you answer that question or did I just totally miss it? Oh, sorry. Oh, I, was, I think it was first, right? Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. Okay. I was just wanting to make sure you had a chance to answer that. Okay, yes, yeah, so we're doing a lightning round questions. So we'll just go through super fast, breeze through these questions. Just whatever your first thought is on these. Um, we'll start with Ben for the first one. Um, plant, pantser, plotter, or planter? Definitely a planter. <laughs> I'm planter. Oh, sorry, that ruined cross. <laughs> we're fine to go whenever. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, we can just go through. I'm a planter. <laughs> I'm also a planter. I now call it discover writing because it sounds better. Oh, that yeah, sounds much that. better. <laughs> There's a roadmap. I just don't know all the stops. And I, 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 act, I literally have to know the end of my books now. It doesn't mm. work to write a thriller without that. So. Mm -hmm. I'm a, I'm a planter. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I'm a planter, but I like to call it a headlights writer. Yeah. Like I can see yeah. what's right ahead of me, but I have to drive a little forward to see what's next. Clear the awesome. fog. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question. We'll start with Christine. What is your gu guilty pleasure read? I don't think we should feel guilty for the things that we like to read. Um, <laughs> but if we're going to do that, I guess I have to say Twilight. <laughs> <laughs> I second Twilight. <laughs> Listen, Twilight made us feel things. Like, that skill. Like, mm -hmm. no matter what, you can't take that away from Stephanie Meyer. She made us all feel something. Um, <laughs> for sure. I, but I agree. I don't, I don't feel guilty at all. I read everything. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I have a guilty pleasure read, because same thing. Like, I read what I want. <laughs> <laughs> as you should. Yeah, I completely agree as well. Completely agree. Didn't never feel guilty about reading or writing whatever you want to read and write. Okay, next question. Um, what is or was the worst part of the COVID pandemic for you? Um, we'll start with Mandy. 
my honeymoon has been um, postponed indefinitely, and it was two weeks in Europe, so. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> I, I haven't uh, left my apartment since March, last March, and I live alone, so I talk to my cats a lot. Yeah, I'm, it's okay. Panels like this are great. Hello, humans. <laughs> I, I've been extremely lucky, really, because um, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm quite an introvert anyway, so I've just kind of got on with it. The, I guess the worst part is just knowing that other people are, are suffering, but it's, um, yeah, I, I certainly can't complain personally. The worst part for me has been the anxiety of been like, my family's not being careful enough and they're going to get COVID and I'm not going to be able to do anything about it because I'm here in California and they're on the East Coast. Yeah. It's been horrifying. And then trying to write a book, like all of us, I were probably trying to write last year and it was like impossible to concentrate at so many times because you were just so intensely anxious and worried about everyone you know and about obviously everything going on in the world. So that was... The anxiety spiral is real. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, agreed. I mean, well, I get a lot of existential like anxiety because I used to work in clinical research and I have a master's in public health. So I like look at like all the epidemiology and be like, this is horrible. But I had to stop re watching the news because of that. Um, I, I will say that like as people creatives, like and we write a lot of things that's escapist, sometimes you start to feel bad being like, oh, is is this really that important for me to be concentrating on right now? Um, and you kind of, you kind of like put yourself down and you start to think like, oh, I should be doing more to help with actual real issues instead of just writing about like fantasy creatures. But at the end of the day, you have to tell yourself like every career is still important and we're doing good for the world by helping people escape reality. <laughs> yeah. I think that's, I think writing is a huge escape. I've definitely read a ton more than I would have without the pandemic. Okay, um, next question. If you could meet up with any book character for lunch, who would it be? Um, we'll start with Kat for this one. Oh no, <laughs> one more time. Um, um, uh, I'm gonna say that I would meet up with um, Susanna from Daughter of Smoke and Bone. She's not the main character. She's actually like the human best friend, but she's spunky and feisty and super interesting, but she probably won't murder me. So like that, that's very important to me, not being murdered. So I choose her. <laughs> I would probably, uh, people are going to kill me for saying this, but I have to fulfill my teen fantasies and meet up with Edward Cullen. That's all. <laughs> would you I be worried to... he can read your mind? Um, I mean, at least the communication would be better. <laughs> <laughs> we can get it out there, you know? I've I've always been really drawn to like uh, characters that where you never quite learn who they are, um, and the first one that sprung to mind is such a stupid answer, but it, it's Willy Wonka. I love I love those kinds of characters where you just never get a true sense of who he, like who even was this guy. It's just this strange character and very eccentric, and uh, yeah, it'd be him for me. Plus, it's lunch, so presumably there's going to be loads of chocolate and weird sweets and stuff. So. <laughs> Right now, I have to say Magnus Bane because I am in the middle of Chain of Iron and like so many things need fixing and I just need to tell him to go check on it. I'm like very anxious about all these characters and he hasn't been around to help save them, which he always is. Um, if you don't know Magnus, he's lived a very long time. He's very funny. He probably tried to blow me off a million times and I'd be like, please, please. Um, listen to me. I'm not just a mundane. I know all about you. Um, but yeah, I think he'd give a lot of good advice too, and um, he'd be a hoot to speak with. This is hard. I wouldn't want to meet with anyone from the thrillers I read. They're mostly hot mess humans. So I'm gonna go with one of my all-time favorite book series. I would want to have lunch with Thursday next, which is by Jasper Ford. She can jump into fiction and like Miss Havisham like taught her everything. Hamlet lived with her for a while. There's time travel. So I would chill with Thursday. Yeah, she's got a pet dodo. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Okay, we're gonna do two more questions. Um, 
Second to last question is, if you weren't an author and you had, had a choice of any other career, what would it be? I would do, okay, I'll, I guess I'll go first. Um, I would for sure do like graphic design. I mean, that's what I did before I got like laid off anyways, but now I've been doing it so much more, whether it be in the book cover design that I do, or I just, I recently bought an iPad just to learn Procreate and it's been such like, so much fun <laughs> just to do these doodles and illustrations and to do something that's not work related um, was something that I was really missing. Like every creative outlet I had was work related and I needed something that was creative that wasn't work. And finding that has been literally one of the best things for my mental health. Oh, that's really cheat. cool. Oh, sorry. Ben, go. <laughs> that's, I was just saying how cool that was. That sounds really awesome. Um, mine's a bit of a cheat. I'd probably be a, a screenwriter or, or maybe a, a director. Um, I, I love, I do really love film and I love TV and I love seeing all that come to life as well, just as much as uh, writing literature. Yeah, I'm going to cheat too. And I'm going to name a job I actually used to have. Um, and I used to be an editor, a book packager. And we also did TV development. Um, and it, the funnest part was to be like, I would love this to be a book, but I know I can't write it. So let me find someone who can write it and create like my dream team and bring the story to life without me actually <laughs> having to do the heavy lifting. And it was, it was really fun. So I would just go back to that. <laughs> All this cheating, guys, I wasn't going to say screenwriter, but that would have been mine too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say, I'm going to say video editor because that's my other thing that I love to do editing. And it's kind of, editing so many YouTube videos of me just talking to the camera has like dulled my love and excitement for editing. But like, I wanted to edit music videos. Like I was obsessed with that all through my teen years. And I would love to do that if I wasn't doing this. Also kind of cheat, meaning it's something that I've uh, done kind of and too seriously considered as a career shift, but uh, I'm not in a position to do right now. It sounds silly. I would be a college admissions counselor at a high school. I would love that. Uh, I know there's a lot of stress that comes with that, but like I used to take those uh, what career should you have things and it always told me I should be a guidance counselor or a teacher. And I was like, lies, because I was like 20. I was like, I'm going to be an author and a journalist. And now I'm like, no, it was right. I should be a guidance counselor, but specifically for college because I, I love that. So someone hire me I'm kidding no um I I I work in tv like I'm I, I like my job <laughs> which is why I didn't pick screenwriter because Hollywood Hollywood uh, it can there there are certain jobs that are great for introverts and I'm like I, I if I'm gonna do like separate career I want to go full introvert and have like an office and just have kids come in and I help them go places yeah that, that'd be great okay awesome um last question and then we'll do some closing remarks um why do you think joy teens should join TABC and writing conferences like this? Um, we'll start with Alexa. I mean, just being able to connect with other writers, especially teen writers, and just building that confidence now is magic. Like, you're ahead of the game. You're doing something you love. You're taking it seriously. You're building community. And like, that's just going to take you places. I'm as Cass said earlier, I wish I'd had this when I was a teenager. It would have been so amazing. Yeah. I agree. Done. That's my answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, also, I mean, well, it's good to have a place to uh, encourage your writing. That's not academic too. Cause academic writing is very specific. So sorry. <laughs> Yeah, and I'll also add on to that because I I so wish I had this when I was a teen. And it took me literally years to find writing friends. But once I did, they're the friends that I talk to on a daily basis. We don't live near each other, but we like video chat once a week. We check in all the time. They're my biggest motivators. Um, so just make those friends, keep them in your back pocket, and they're always there when you need the motivation. Yeah, I think one of the absolute best things you can do is to to do what you guys are already doing, which is to uh, attend things like this, speak to other writers, just
can about writing and you're you, you know you're, you're already halfway there you're doing you're doing great so um yeah i think teen off book boot camp is an amazing initiative yeah what everyone else said and i mean finding your people especially writing people is so hard and here you just have a resource to find other writers that you're that are your age that you can grow with and that was like finding other people like me i didn't find that until booktube and I made so many aspiring author friends and friends who are creating content like me. It changed everything. Like once you have a group of people to support you and you support them and it feels great. And that's like what you can do here with the writing. Okay. Well, um, thank you all so much for coming and for being willing to be a part of this. I know all the teens on here today and when they watch it on YouTube will be completely inspired and hopefully have some really good advice for them to keep writing. Um, so just as I mentioned, there are there is the giveaway on Instagram, so go check that out and sign up for TABC if you'd like to come to the conference as well as we do have weekly webinars that you can follow on our Instagram and we have the Fantasy Trivia Night coming up. So definitely register for those. Um, we, Me and Lauren are gonna stay on for any other questions you guys have on TABC. Um, or any future events like that. Um, our panelists are free to go. Um, thank you, thank you so much, guys. It's really been magical. I know that me and Lauren have just been really grateful for your willingness to join. And if you guys want to stay on and answer questions, awesome. If not, you're free to go. Yeah, we so, know that yeah. some of you guys have prior commitments and things, and lives are really busy, but we definitely have questions if you want to continue answering them. But if not, me and Madeline can take them on too. I can, I can stick around. I'm happy to stay. Listen, Alexa it was right. Like, we need human interaction. <laughs> like, don't force us to leave. Not just me and the cats. <laughs> <laughs> and a book and an act two that's screaming at me to be written. So. Oh, no. Okay. Well, I'm going to jump on the Q&A and pick a couple questions from there. Okay. Um, oh, I like this one. Um, Charlize Wen asked, when you have an idea for writing, how do you start bringing that idea into reality? I'll go first, I guess. Um, <laughs> I was, so what I do, and I assume everyone has uh, varying processes, but I just write down literally everything um, because you never know what's a bad idea until you have it all down on paper. And sometimes two separate ideas will morph together to make a third idea. But basically the essence is, is that you write down and brainstorm as much as possible. Um, and I, like I said, I like to work in the save the cat beats. So I usually like to identify like the different beats, like what could the catalyst be? Um, and come up with a bunch of different options for catalysts and kind of highlight the ones that I like the most. I have a very messy brainstorming process. If someone else has a cleaner one, I'd love to hear about it, but mine is just scribbles everywhere. Oh, I like, I like the idea of like not, um, caging yourself in and like with your brainstorming, cause that should be the pro Brainstorming is the process that I believe should be the messiest. Um, uh, for one of my freelance jobs, I work on the serialized online fiction, and it's very, very much based on like how soap operas are <laughs> formatted. And it's taught me that no idea is a bad idea. We throw around the weirdest stuff, like, oh, she has amnesia because she the werewolf fight was poison to her. Like, and and the best thing about that is no one in that writer's room will laugh at you, which gives me so much confidence in being absolutely <laughs> ridiculous. Um, so don't self-reject, first of all, your ideas. And the second thing of like, if you need a checklist, then I would definitely just make sure that you definitely have an inciting incident. You definitely have an external and internal conflict and you have an idea of how you wanna resolve those two conflicts. If you have those three plot points, then you can fill in the gaps in the middle as any way you want and probably create a story. Yeah, I don't even write it down usually. Uh, so my, my percolation process can be very long and that's just part of the advice of having it be reality. Give it as long as it needs. It, like 
sometimes it's years for me until that lightning bolt hits. I'm like, oh, like that the, my current thriller I'm writing, like l- I thought of the twist almost three years ago, but it didn't have a plot until 18 months ago. And it didn't have a, uh, a linchpin for the anta- for the victim. That's, that's all these different pieces. Like, w- why would people want to kill this person? Didn't come until last summer. This that's part of my wild process. But part of making it reality, uh, I write a synopsis. It sucks, but it helps. It doesn't have to be the entire book. But what's nice about a synopsis is it's just top line. So my plants or brain can handle that. I don't outline. Um, write it. Usually, if you can get a synopsis to the midpoint, you can write a book, and that helps me. Like. I know that if I can get that far in a synopsis, I can start writing. And another part of making it reality for me personally, first lines, first scenes, first pages. Like once I that zaps into my brain, I can write a book. So it's whatever works for you. Um, follow your process. It's, it's cool. Um, but I should write more down and I don't. And then I forget things. For me, it was very similar to Amanda. I like do just write everything in my brain down because I will forget it and then be mad and be like, that was the perfect this, even though it isn't. But you know, you get stuck on that and you can't move forward. Um, And then I go to, I think Ben was saying this earlier, like the questions about your character, like what do they want? What's in their way? Um, you know, and what's the flaw that's preventing them that they can grow like that. Those three questions can unlock so much in your brain. Once you know that about your character, you're like, oh, they would do this to get to this. And things just start to flow and you just write all of it down before you forget. And then you can jump into writing for me at least. Yeah, absolutely. I think mine, mine is sort of a big mess of all of those combined. Um, I don't, necessarily write a whole synopsis like Alexa but I'll try and write sort of a blurb almost like if I was going to explain it to someone in a bar this is what I would say and this is what's going to motivate me to write it because it sounds really cool and I want to write this book for this blurb for this book that doesn't even exist yet and then what I'll kind of do is try and plan a bit like what Kat said um, about having the the uh, I can't remember the exact word that you use, but the word that I always say is, is like the tent posts. What are the major events that are going to hold this thing up? Anything between up for grabs. I can, as long as I get, well, sometimes it doesn't even work out that I get from A to B and it's just, a, you know, I realize that B has to change, but I try and at least have the, the tent posts that are going to hold it up and I've got something to aim for. If it changes, that's fine. But I, I don't like to be completely in the dark about where I'm going because that is is scary but plants is kind of we have a a rough idea but we don't outline either because that's that's too scary in the other direction yeah well then let's think about another question I'm seeing Taylor in the chat is asking about how you finish first drafts and maybe that kind of relates to our last question a bit. Like I think Alexa, that kind of goes along with what you were saying, but I struggle with this personally. So I'd like to hear your guys' take too. So well, how I, think the most imp- <laughs> I think the most important thing is to not um, limit yourself to what you define a first draft as. A lot of authors I know, especially when they're on de- deadline, create what we call a skeleton draft. And that's pretty much like, you know that you're not being as descriptive as you probably want to be um, by like by you know the end product you're just mainly writing down like the plot beats um dialogue that comes to you how the conversation is supposed to go and flow um but like you know a lot of this advice that you get like to flesh out your book like oh don't make it talking heads explain the setting explain like how they're feeling in this moment don't let that weigh you down. Just get everything on the page that you can so that the main point of like the plot and the through lines and the character arc are down on the page. And then you can go back and flesh it out. But like, once you have all of that down, you can consider that your first draft. Some people call it a zero draft because they're trying to be cheeky. But like, I think that like for us to think like you have to have every single thing in the, a first draft that you would want to include, that's limiting. And it kind of, st- it kind of stunts your creativity sometimes. So don't, don't do that to yourself. Yeah. And I know for me, there's only been like really one time where I just for the life of me could not finish a first draft. And that was for the thriller novel that I was working on. 
And for me, it came down to why am I struggling so much to finish this first draft? And at first it was because I was struggling to wrap it all up. And to me, it was like, I almost need to write a book too, but I didn't want to write a book too. So what in the book do I need to change so I can describe this all in one book? Because I didn't want a thriller to somehow turn into two books. So I guess it just comes down to really identifying what is stopping you. Is it because you don't know where the plot's going or because you've lost motivation and really just exploring the possibilities and figuring out what you might need to change to finish that first draft. But yeah, one of the big things is just not letting perfection stop you because the first draft doesn't have to be perfect. It can be a hot mess. You can always fix it later. Yeah, and a big thing for me is I, it, I had to stop myself from editing as I go. Uh, I know some people can manage it, but for me, that was a huge thing holding me back because of per the perfection idea. I was trying to make it glossy and pretty, but middles are notoriously hard. I feel most people fall flat on their face in the middle. Like it's the place where you're most likely to struggle. And so for me, just the, the, the how do you finish a draft in the middle, you have to constantly psych yourself up, give yourself pep talks. Like if you have writers in your circle, like you need those cheerleaders. That is the moment. Do whatever you have to do to get through the middle, including don't go back and read the beginning because you'll start nitpicking. Remind yourself over and over again, I can change it later. Because at least for me personally, once I get over, it's like the, the, hurt, look, the midpoint, the hurdle of the midpoint, and then the plot starts to tumble downhill. I know I can finish a book. And then the other thing I've done personally on every single book like Clockwork, I have stalled out slightly at the 10K, like 10K from the end-ish. I go back to the beginning and then like, if I can go back and start editing, do an edit pass, if I know there's only like a tiny bit to write at the end and that usually actually helps me write my ending. Do that if you think that'll work for you um, and you won't get stuck in the weeds of editing the rest of the book forever. But that personally has worked for me. Um, knock on wood, we'll see how it goes with this one. <laughs> it's a uh, yeah you caught me at, it had a really fun time the middle is so hard but like we all we've all experienced it and it's just you can't give up that's the main thing don't give up I it's better to write middles. something bad than not write <laughs> middle I love writing middles so but every time I say that people oh, think I'm weird why it's so oh, I'm, it's, you know I'm in the fun and games it's just killing me well, because because fun and games like the ending has to be payoff, right? For everything that came before. So a lot of pressure. And the beginning has to set it up in a way where you care about everyone. So a lot of pressure, but the middle, you assume everyone already <laughs> cares. You get to do all the angsty stuff. Like, oh, I killed my brother or something like that. Like, that's the fun part. Like the long stares or like the threatening part. Uh, unfortunately in a thriller, that's when all of the threads have to actually happen and make sense. And this well, is where I, I thrillers. Like, that's my problem. I'm like, <laughs> I've literally, I had a moment last week of like, wait, what is the killer's plan? I didn't think this through. They had a plan. Sure. I'll be fine. This is, this is the process. <laughs> It'll all come together. I can fix anything later. It's fine. Yeah. I, for me, it helps to just like, I feel like for my first book, I remember not being like happy with how I had planned to end it. And then, but like, I just wrote the end anyway, knowing that like, I can change to the end. I'm past like everything else. And another thing that helped the first draft was just like focusing on my main two characters instead of like trying to carry through the lines of like all the side characters. Cause those you can, you, you it's better once you know the book, once you know the main character's plot, you can weave in the side character's plots in the next, you know, the next two drafts or so. Um, and you can always change whatever you have. Like everyone said, like, just know that like, you're going to go back. So it's fine. It's a problem for, you know, future me. Yeah, that's very true. I, I think I heard Neil Gaiman say the process of writing a second draft is to make it look like you knew what you were doing the first time around I think that's on the masterclass advert um, but what I like to do and I don't necessarily recommend this is I will I'll write one chapter and polish it and polish it until it's as perfect as I can get it and then I know that that's like the benchmark it's like yes that is what the book is this chapter what I've written that's what the book the whole book needs to be as good as that 
And then it makes it a lot easier for me to write the rest of the first draft because I kind of know what it is now. And, and because I've got this one scene that I'm really happy with, I feel a lot more motivated to just then finish the rest of the draft. It doesn't have to be as good as that yet, but that's what I'm aiming for. That's what the book is. And then I feel a lot more prepared. Okay, are you guys game for one more question? This webinar closes at 4 EST. I'm in the EST time zone, two o'clock um, MST, but like it'll just end us. So we could do one more question if you guys feel comfortable or we can just yeah. head off now. What do you guys feel like? I'm good. To All right, you guys are game. It might cut us off, but we can see. Uh, Madeline, if you wanna read that. Yeah, okay, um, let me find that question. Oh, and I have it up too, if that's easier. Oh, you do? Do you want to read it out loud then? Okay, so Sarah is asking about what are the best and worst things about the publication process? And how do you recommend, she says me, or just people start finding an agent and getting into the process and how to get started when you have limited connections? So it's a loaded question. <laughs> so, <Exactly. yeah. laughs> Well, uh, I'm like word. waiting for Alexa to just answer this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, uh, at, least, at least on the TradPub site, it's slow. I, I would, mm -hmm. I think we can all class that under worst. It's the patience you have to develop. It's, and, and the lack of control over certain things. Like you just like, I just assume publicity is working on stuff and they'll tell me when it's important. And that's always fun. Um, what else? Yeah, it's like one of the, oops, sorry. Oh, sorry, there, I was talking. <laughs> Go ahead, Christine. No, I just like, this is, this is not exactly, I feel like the answer we're looking for, but like deadline, being on deadline for your entire book, like the beauty of your first book was that like, you weren't on deadline to write that first draft. And like, it has been shiny, so much more stressful being on deadline for every version of the draft. Because when I like went on submission, I had been, I was on draft six, you know, this is now it was like <laughs> the whole time, like, oh God, oh God, it's coming, it's happening. Um, So it's, and I, you know, you learn to get better at that, but that was my first time going through like that stress. Um, And that's something, that I I don't think I took for granted because I knew it was coming when I wrote my first job I was like the next one if I'm on deadline it's going to be harder but uh just like the beauty like take it all in on the first draft like you have all this time to make it as like exactly what you want I think the worst part of the publishing process is the comparison game it's a reality of publishing and like, I want to be real with y'all, but like, it's so hard because like, no matter what, you're going to get compared. It's, I mean, partly to help sell your book. Like we have these things called comps, which are comparative titles. It's like your book is like Six of Crows and hoping that people who like Six of Crows will, will read your book, but it, it snowballs really fast. So like, if you can steal yourself against comparing yourself overly much to your peers and also like, it sucks because then there's there's so many different levels of publishing like comparing yourself to someone who's been published for 10 years is not healthy and like your, their career is not going to be your career right now as a debut um it happens a lot to diverse writers too um i get compared to literally every single asian fantasy that will ever come out um and and it it is really stressful but like i've i've kind of like gotten myself in a headspace where I know what my writing is and the people who matter to me know what my writing is and that's the most important thing to me um but yeah it can be it can be a lot and publishing likes to use like really catchy like oh this this author who's like only 17 like published to make so ageism exists because of that or this publisher who got a major deal so like like money financial issues happen because of that like that's publishing's issue. Don't let it be your issue. <laughs> like, please, please. Um, it's Cause it, it, it can be a lot. And we have enough stress and anxiety we have to deal with without having to deal with all of that. <laughs> so, I'll yeah. On a I, best. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh no, you go, you go. <laughs> uh, just briefly uh, uh, in terms of best, um, you're not alone. You have mm. an agent if you're, you're on the traditional publishing track. You, you have editors, someone who's gonna read over your book whether that's dev edits, line edits, copy edits, and like you, 
anytime you're writing and publishing, you're working with other people to help you get there. And I like that a lot, that there are experts out there. You can hire a cover designer if you're self-publishing. You can hire an editor just like at Trad, like we'll work with those as well. And I, I need a safety net personally. And I, I like that. Um, and, and the community. I think that's a pro no matter what uh, avenue you're doing. Like there, there's a great writing community and you can find your people. Yeah. And I would say from like the self-publisher perspective, there's a lot of like the same thing. Obviously we don't have like the hard deadlines. We still give ourselves deadlines, but it's not like the, I can't imagine it's the same level of stress. Um, but the, be the best part is that you get to decide on everything. The worst part is that you get to decide on everything. Uh, there's no one there to tell you when you're about to make a major screw up. And trust me, we've all done it. <laughs> um, there's like, especially with self-publishing, there's a lot of learning, like a lot of, I mean, no matter whether you're self or traditional, you're going to realize there's some marketing that you have to do. But when you're self-published, you're alone. Unless you hire someone, which costs money, you're alone. And on that note, um, everything comes out of your pocket. But I, I guess the best part of self-publishing is the fact that, you know, you get to pave your own path and you have con complete control over your career and you can decide whatever it is you want to do, um, even though that vision may feel a little blurry sometimes. Yeah, I don't, I don't really have anything to add to that. I think uh, I'd only be repeating what everybody else has said. It's great. But just to touch on the like how to get an agent thing, um, which is only necessary if you do want to go the traditional publishing route, which as we've already discussed is not the only route to get your story out there. But if that's really what you want to do, I think um, the biggest thing is to, uh, is to research. <laughs> um, just because just because every agent is different, what they want, we call it a manuscript wish list oftentimes, which can be abbreviated to MSWL. If you go hashtag MSWL on Twitter, you'll find a lot of those. There's also a website called manuscriptwishlist.com. Um, if you look up the hashtag, hashtag am querying, am querying, um, a lot of people like to give advice on that. Also hashtag query tips. Um, and then the other thing to do, if you just want a jumping off point, go to your favorite books on your bookshelf look in the acknowledgements, see who the agents of these authors are. If you write books that are similar to that, they might be interested in your book as well. That's a jumping off point, still do research afterwards. Um, and then the final thing I will say about finding an agent is that a lot of people talk about it like, I have a dream agent. And we actually do give the advice that that's not great to go into the agent search with because even though they might be the agent of your favorite book or your favorite author, an agent-author relationship is a really important and close-knit relationship for your professional career. And so they should fit you personally. And so their working style as an agent is very important to fit what you need, not to fit what Lainey Taylor needs or what Lee Bardugo needs. It has to be about you. You're the star here. So um, it's really important to know that you're approaching it in, from a personal place like that and not putting them on a pedestal in any way. Yeah, and just uh, practically follow professionals on Twitter when you find an agent who's interesting. You don't have to have a, re a book ready to query. It's actually great to start early, but follow them and you'll get a sense of personality. You'll see who's repped by who. Um, also, uh, when the time comes, sign up for Query Tracker. Dot net. Uh, it's a place to track your queries and it has a database and you can read comments of other people of uh, their experiences with agents. Um, Publishers Marketplace is a really good tool. Find someone with a subscription to look people up for you. You can do that. Or it, it is and it costs money, but you could do it for one month for $25. That's kind of like when you are actually ready, but that can be a research tool. It, uh, agents post their sales to Publishers Marketplace so you can look things up. And then YouTube. We're all on YouTube and uh, many of the people, in, including some of us who are on the Trad pub side, have posted videos about querying and agents. And there's a ton of resources and beyond us, there's a, there's a lot of great people posting. So you can find resources there, yeah. Well, thank you guys so much. We're about to get kicked off, but thank you guys for coming. Thank you attendees, panelists. I've loved hearing you guys talk. I've learned a lot and I hope that everyone else has learned a lot too. You guys are all lovely people.
and have a and wonderful we, day. Huh? Thank you. We're going to figure out how to post this on YouTube because <laughs> we didn't have to do it on YouTube live. We will figure that out so we can put that on there. But yeah, as Lauren said, just thank you all. Thanks so. for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Thank you.